my name is Tawny Smith and I am one of the members here at Desert Grace. We have a great message for you today. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to give us a thumbs up and leave a comment so we know that you've been blessed. May God continue to bless your family. Uh, my name's Melissa Reitmeyer and I am from Chandler, Arizona. My husband and I uh, are married 33 years now in November it will be. And uh, we attend Crossroads Church of the Nazarene, so we're part of the Arizona district, so we're part of your family, and uh, it's good to be here. Unfortunate that I'm here because Pastor um, Clint is ill, but we're praying for him as well and have great confidence that uh, the Lord's going to bring healing, and Carissa might have a hand in that. You think? <laughs> I think she just might. Well, here's how I want to greet you. I want to say, you are an answer to my prayer. You really are an answer to my prayer. And I say that with tremendous confidence. I, um, one of the ministries that I do is prayer ministry um, at Crossroads, and I've done that for any church that I've been in. And what I love to do is pray the scriptures. And I know that when I'm praying the scripture, that I am praying God's will for his people. And that's just the safest place to be, right? And so when we pray the Lord's scripture, then he wants that to happen. He wants that to come about, right? And so um, I have been praying this prayer out of John 17. And how many of you have read this chapter in John, John 17. And, you know, usually it's called like the high priestly prayer that Jesus prayed. We're not going to go through the entire thing because it, we could spend literally months going through the entire prayer. So we're just going to focus on three verses in John 17 today. But what I know about this particular prayer is that every single body of believers is the answer to this prayer. And so I'm gonna take us on a journey about how I know that and what that actually looks like in a body of, of believers today. So um, if you have your Bible, I would suggest you open it up, whether you're like me and you have it on a tablet or your phone or the actual real deal in uh, paper. I love that kind too, by the way. Um, and Austin, will you have it up on the screen? It's there already, look at that. That's what that big thing is. <laughs> so I'm going to read it out loud, and I would recommend that you keep your finger here and keep your Bible open to this passage because we're going to be looking at it a lot this morning. So this is Jesus praying for us. This is Jesus praying for every single person who will ever believe the gospel. And this is what he says. It's incredible. He says, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, which was the disciples that he was with, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you've given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them, even as you have loved me. Imagine this, Jesus praying this prayer really not too long before he was going to be crucified. And he knew the sacrifice that it would take for this prayer to be answered. And he prayed it with such boldness. And so we can go before the throne also praying yeah. it with boldness. And so he, here we are today, right now, together as one, being perfected in unity, in worship, in prayer, in the preaching of the word, in fellowship, all of that being perfected in unity, which tells me 
that God has been answering this prayer for 21 centuries. 21 centuries. God has been answering this prayer. And I know that because we're here. And people have loved you and me and my husband Mike into the kingdom that were loved into the kingdom that were loved into the kingdom on and on all the way back to the beginning for 21 centuries. And I honestly think it's nothing short of a miracle because if it wasn't going to take a miracle, I don't think Jesus would have prayed for it. We would have just expected that it would have happened. It's a miracle every time a body of believers is perfected in unity. This is what John says, or Jesus says. He says, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. I think it's really, honestly, the most important prayer we can pray in the church. And it's been, it's been being answered Uh, for 21 centuries. It is a miracle of the body being perfected in unity. We belong to a global church being perfected in unity together, the Nazarene Church. Recently, many of us came together in Indiana as a global body being perfected together. Over 30, we were there, it was like I don't know, reports of 20 to 30,000 people praising and worshiping God together. That was incredible. Um, But I have to say, they're skeptics, right? Not everybody thinks that the church is doing well. There are people who would say, well, the church is in trouble, right? That um, it's hard. People don't want to hear the gospel anymore. The church is irrelevant. And our society is ailing. There are, we, could, we could talk all day about the things happening in our society, right? Teen depression is rampant, suicide. There's just a tremendous amount of things that seem to be going wrong. And people say, well, the church is irrelevant now. But I would say, The church that is the answer to this prayer is hardly irrelevant. The difference is being perfected in unity together. I know, and I would venture to say, you guys all know that the gospel and this truth is the answer to our ailing society. Jesus is the answer, it's that simple. But again, it's nothing short of a miracle. So I kind of want to take us on a journey to think, uh, help us think through, well, how did we actually get here where it takes a miracle for unity to happen? And probably every century, it's a greater and greater level of miracle. At least it seems that way to us, but I don't know. Maybe they thought it was far worse back then. So you guys willing to go on a journey with me? We're going we're gonna to start in Genesis, but don't worry, we're not going to begin there and read the whole thing, but that is where we're going to start. So let's look at what happened when humanity was created. If you look in Genesis 2, that is the most detailed account of how uh, mankind was created. We see it in Genesis 1, we see it in Genesis 2. Um, we know that human, the first human, we call him what? Adam? Yeah, well, that's not really his name. We, he doesn't actually have a given name. Ha-Adam is the human. And, and that's why we call him Adam, because we didn't know what else to call him. <laughs> but Ha-Adam, which I'll refer to sometimes, means the human. Okay, so we know that Ha-Adam was created out of dust and God breathed life into Ha-Adam and he became a living creature, the only one that it was ever said that is created in the image and the likeness of God. Certainly incredibly sacred, 
wouldn't you agree, incredibly sacred. And God said that it was so good. And he gave Ha'adam a very special mission. And that mission was to, um, to really rule over the earth. That was Ha'adam's mission. And so there's only one at this point. And finally, God says, I think we need to help this man out. We need to help Hadam out. And so I'm going to create a second Ha'adam out of the first. This is what he says. So in Genesis 2, 21 to 24, God builds woman out of the side of man. Now I know our English translations, every one of them that I have looked at, the oldest one to the most current, all say what? That's right, they all say rib. The word is sela, and it, honestly, it doesn't mean rib. And I don't mean to say that I'm a Bible scholar far smarter than all of these other people that have been translating the Bible, but there are 17 uses of it elsewhere in the Bible, and do you know what it refers to? Side, it refers to a side, and, and in 16 of those 17, it refers to this a sacred structure, the side of a sacred structure. Think of, and this is how it's referenced, a temple, a sanctuary, an altar, the Ark of the Covenant. That's what this term is used as in other places in the Bible. This is the only place it was translated rib, and that's because they didn't know what else to say. Nobody knows really what God took out of Ha-Adam to make woman. But let's read this passage considering that the word really means a sake, the side of a sacred structure. And considering that Ha-Adam is made in the image of God, it's not at all a stretch to think that man is a sacred structure of God. So, Genesis 2, 21 to 22, with a little bit of literary liberty here, would go like this. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. And then he took part of this sacred structure, and he closed up the flesh at that place. And the Lord God fashioned another sacred structure, the woman, which he had taken from the man, and brought her to the man. So Ha'adam, the sacred structure, we had had one. God said, we need two, We we need two. And then listen to the first thing, the first command that they received together is this, become one. You were one. (laughs) I made you two. Become one flesh. That's the first command. This is what it means, become one. Fasten yourself to one another. Possess characteristics of one living thing. That living thing is the one in whose image you were created. Act as if you are still one Ha Adam, and not two independent humans. This is the first call to unity, and it gives us an insight into what Jesus was praying for, his call to unity. So what's the first thing that is recorded that man and woman do as one? They eat the forbidden fruit. The first thing that they do, completely united, as far as we know, is they sin. And being united, perfected in unity, doesn't guarantee things are gonna go well. And so what happened, you guys, we we all know, right? We see the result of this, and it began right there and then, fracture. Fracture happened between Ha'adam and God and one another. 
fracture happened, separation happened. It became harder and harder to not only be united with the Father, but united together to be as one ha-adam. It became harder and harder. And you don't even have to read far going into Genesis 3 and just reading and continuing in the Bible to, to see the stories and the result. We see the killing, we see the stealing, we see the lying, we see the slander, we see all of it. Fracture, fracture, fracture. But Jesus prayed that they may all be one. Even as you, Father, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. So there's unity. If we go even a little bit further into Genesis, um, Genesis 11, we're going to find out what happens when people, a full load of people, a whole bunch of people, become united, but with ill intentions, right? You guys may have read about this. Um, they came together in one place, with one language, with one intention, and that was to build a city with a tower that stretched into the heavens so they could make their name great, their name great. But they were united. And this is what God had to say about that in Genesis eleven six. 6. He says, behold, they are one people and they all have the same language. And this is what they began to do. Now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. That's the power of unity. But because it was with ill intentions, what does God do? Well, this is why. We have multiple nations scattered across the earth, multiple languages, because further fracturing. And God did that to protect mankind from their worst intentions, which is making their own name great and trying to become like God's further fracturing of the human race, and that is always, that is always the result. But God, he never ever abandoned his desire for mankind made in his image. He doesn't. You read the Bible and story after story is filled with redemption and reconciliation and pulling mankind back to himself. That's what God does. That's what God does. Because we're made in his image, we are sacred, we are a sacred structure. And as a body of believers, sacred, temple, together. And Jesus prayed that they may all be one. That they may all be one. So, today, God's call is, though you are many, ha Adam, scattered across the earth, speaking many languages with many cultures. Be one. Fasten yourselves together. Fasten yourselves together. Behave as if you were one ha-adam created in the image of God, which indeed is what we are. That's today's call. That's why Jesus prayed that they would be perfected in unity so that the people scattered across the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. Yes. So what's the solution? The solution is now we move into the New Testament. See, I told you we wouldn't like read the whole Old Testament. So now we're gonna look into the New Testament to see, well, what is this solution? I really don't think God is ever the kind, he, he's not the kind of God that says, well, I think this is what you ought to do. I know it's impossible, they'll never be able to do it, but I'm just gonna keep telling them that over and over and over again. 
That's not really who God is. Every time God says to do something, he has already given us the resources and everything that we need to do it. He never calls us to do something that is impossible for us with him. Amen. With him, right? So in the letter that he wrote to the church in Ephesus, Paul prayed that they would understand not only how incredible, but also how possible their calling to be perfected in unity in Christ actually is. He wanted them and he wants us to know that Jesus has given us everything that we need to be the answer to his prayer. He has given us all power, all authority, and all glory. He has given us all authority, all power, and all of his glory for the purpose that we may be perfected in unity with him as the head so that people will know the love of God. There is only, that is the only way that this works. In Ephesians uh, 1.22, um, this is what, this is what Paul says, that the Father put all things in subjection under Jesus' feet. This was after the resurrection. And he gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body. So think the sacred structure, that, that the Father put all things under subjection under Jesus' feet and gave him as head of, of, over all things for his sacred body, the church. He's the head, we're the body. What do you think of when you hear the word, Jesus is the head? Is he leader? Yeah. That, that's like, that's a really good, like Western kind of thought, very contemporary, he's our leader. But if I'm a Hebrew reader in the first century, that is, maybe I think that, but what I'm really gonna think is about my body, and I'm gonna think about my head. What is my head? My head is where the source of life comes from. I eat and I drink through my mouth. I breathe through my nose. I see with my eyes, I hear with my ears, everything I think. I can't live without my head. It is my very source of life. It is the very source of life. Jesus knew this. Think of some of the words that we have in the Bible, taste and see that the Lord is good. Faith comes by hearing, right? There is a sweet aroma of the Lord. The source of life that, that is the only solution to the body of Christ being perfected in unity is that body becoming one, right? United, completely held together as if they were one to the source of life itself, the head, the head. Amen. So we're perfected in unity to him. Unity within the church that is not connected to Jesus as the head creates a fluctuating and eventually deteriorating standard that only results in further fracturing. And maybe that's why we see today that people think the church is irrelevant. Maybe that's a reason why. Our unity must be with God the Father and God the Son together with each other. Otherwise, it will be a false unity, no different than that of a ball team or a rotary club or a sewing circle. We're perfected in unity with one another as we are united with the Father and the Son together. And 21 centuries of believers tells me that this miracle occurs. Us together tells me this miracle does occur so that the world may know how much the Father loves them, as much as he loves his son. 
enough to raise him from the dead and to let him sit at his right hand. So when I read, let's go back to John 17. Let's read this passage one more time. I'm going to, will you pull it up, Austin? I'm going to find it here again on my notes. There we go. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you've given me, I've given to them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them, even as you have loved me. When I read this passage, I honestly, and, and a lot of times in the Bible, I want to see myself, where do I fit in this passage? God, the Father's in Jesus, Jesus is in the Father, he's in us, we're in them. Like, I, I get confused. Does anybody else get a little confused? Do you really want to know, like, what is happening? I do. So, I, um, I would like to do like a demonstration of what I think is actually happening. And I want to be able to show you what it looks like, what I think God is saying to us, what unity actually looks like. So, I, I need three volunteers to come up on stage. And it doesn't matter how old you are. You don't have to like speak. I love this. You guys are so good. You don't have to speak. Um, you just have to be able to follow instructions. Is this, a, is this a thing for you guys? Okay, good. I'll be right back. This is very good. Very good. Thank you. All right, so t tell me your names. You, Sean. Sean. Laura. Laura. Gretchen. Gretchen. Okay. We have Sean, Laura, and Gretchen. They're going to do some very important things for us today. Um, so this is good. Sean, would you put this over your head? Okay. We're going we're gonna to kind of act out. Don't worry, I'm not an actor, so it's okay if you all don't feel like you're actresses or actors. I'm they. You're they. It's my pronoun. Hey. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you, they, you are they. You're 21 centuries of believers. Can you, are you up for that? I am. That's excellent. Okay. You're the son. We're all sons and daughters. You're the father. This is a big deal. Okay. So what I like to do is I'm going to have us, let's think about this. So when somebody says, um, Jesus is in me, who do you physically see? Me, right? Jesus is in me. So the way that we're going to do this is the person that is in the other one will be behind them because you see the person that is the forefront. We're going to work this out. It'll be terrific, I promise. Okay. <laughs> all right, so this is good. You're all lined up that way. So, Father, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me. So, Son, you come forward, and let, we're going to line up right here. Okay. So, does you guys agree that that's kind of what that would look like? This is, this is the Son, and the Father, you, Father, are in me. So we see the Son. This is not a problem, is it? Because they're really one anyway. I don't have any problem. Uh, and I in you. Okay, now you've got to switch. Now, the Father, right? Jesus is in the Father. Okay, this is very good. You're very, very good actors. Um, that they, 21 centuries of believers, may also be in us. So I think you have to go behind the sun. Now, what do you think of that? Does that look, does that seem right? Right? We've got the father first, we've got the son, and they are behind, right? Seems right that the father would be in the front. This is very good, but we're not done. Unfortunately, it gets a little crazy. The glory which you've given to me, I've given to them. So... You have glory. 
You have to keep one, give two to Jesus, the son, and the son has to give the glory to they, 21 centuries of believers. Oh, this is so good, that's exactly what I want. Hold it above your head, do you mind? Oh, <laughs> well why didn't we think of this earlier? <laughs> Who is gonna be in front? Okay, so the glory, this is so good. Without the glory, we cannot be perfected in unity. So this is great, okay. So you'd think it would be over, but it's not. Then, so the glory which you've given me, I've given to them, that they may be one just as we are one. So this is good, this is good. I, in them, okay. Son, you have to move behind they. Right, I in them, Jesus steps behind they, and you, Father, in me. Oh, would you go behind them? No, wait a second. Okay. That they, they, may be perfected in unity. Look at that. Who's in front now? She's got the glory. Does this work? Who does the world see? The world sees they. But who is the source of life for they? Isn't that incredible? I think this is the secret to being perfected in unity. This is the secret to being perfected in unity. I think it's possible. We are indeed out front. We are the messengers. We are the ones that Jesus calls forward to, to go, right? What did he say? After his, resurrec after his resurrection, he breathed on his disciples and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the glory, right? Yeah. And later, he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go. Who's he telling to go? They. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded. And behold, I'm with you. I am with you to the end of the age. All the glory. The Father never gave up his glory. He just shares it. And he tells us, share my glory. Give my glory away. I gave it to you. You give my glory away. So I honestly don't know if I have this analogy right. It's an analogy, so if, it's, if you think there's holes in it, there probably are because it's an analogy. But for me, it helps me understand. I hope it helps you understand. Perfected in unity, there's only one way. The source of life living through the body is how we become perfected in unity. So let's thank these fantastic actors. Thank you. You guys are great. You're so brave. I looked really harmful, huh? Like, who knows what could happen if anybody goes up there. Thanks so much. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. So I'd like to invite us into a time of prayer considering what Jesus prayed. And one more time, if we could have, um, if we could have uh, John 17 up on the screen, 20 to 23, I'd like us to read it out loud together. We are perfected in unity when together we are seeking the source and receiving all that the source has for us. There is something that we learn in community and when we are one Hadam, one Ha'adam that we cannot learn isolated. We need each other. Actually, I think that's why the Church of the Nazarene does membership because we need each other and we need to know we can count on one another. So I'll start off and if you guys would join me in reading this together and consider it Jesus' prayer, your prayer, okay? I do not ask on behalf of these alone, 
but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. So a miracle has occurred today because we're together being perfected in unity, but for one purpose, not really only for our own edification, but so that people in the world will know that the Father loves them. So I am going to pray a benediction, uh, really give you a benediction. I don't know if you guys do that here, but if you'd like to stand up and hold your hands out to receive a benediction, and then when I'm done, the worship team will sing you out of here. So just the opening of your hands just says, I'm gonna receive this. So may you become perfected in unity. Fasten yourselves to one another. Possess characteristics of one living thing. That living thing is the one in whose image you are created. Act as if you are one ha-adam and not independent human beings. Be perfected in unity. Thank you. Thank you for watching this message with me. If you want to see more, make sure you hit the subscribe button and the bell to be notified when we go live or post a new video. We'd also like to invite you to join us in person for a service. Visit us at desertgrace.org or give us a call at 928-305-1132. Thank you and have a great day.